All right, so Max is going to talk about building Laravel APIs with a project that he put together called Laravel API Boilerplate. Thanks, Max. Cool. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Hope you're happy to be here as well. Uh, sorry about the weather in Sydney. It's usually better. So yeah, um, as Michael said, so this is about a project I've put together. Uh, I think I released it May of this year publicly, so I'll be speaking a little bit about it. But first, uh, about me. So for those of you not familiar, which is probably most of you, uh, I've been doing PHP for a very long time. I've worked on many projects. Just at the moment, I'm working at a great company called Cover Genius. Uh, it's a little startup from Sydney, but we've grown quite a lot over the last year. It's, uh, Really interesting stuff we do with um, API development in the insurance space. Uh, if you're looking for a job, come chat to me. Um, yeah, you can find me on some social media that I don't really use it very much, but um, anyhow. Uh, yeah, so the why, as in the why of why every project should be an API first project. Um, yeah, so I don't know how to tell you this more, but API first is a really big deal. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you will already be doing this, but Maybe some people aren't, so I'll just kind of very quickly go over what are the benefits. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so essentially, why should, you, um, why should you build your backend entirely as a REST API? Well, it's extremely good. It's very forward thinking. Um, it follows this kind of build it once, uh, use it everywhere mentality. You can have multiple different front ends all using the same backend logic. Um, the business logic is consistent. You can have mobile apps using it at the same time. If a partner comes to you and says, hey, do you have an API I can use? You don't have to spend you know, any time building one. It's already there. Essentially, you just have to do something for authorization. But otherwise, it's uh, really convenient. And it's, it's easier to test. Um, it's much easier to refactor code because it's decoupled. It's much easier to manage, um, especially from a project management and organizational perspective. Um, yeah, you do have that strong decoupling. Uh, and it allows those rich JavaScript front ends that everybody loves. And of course, it enables microservices as well. It's all the rage nowadays. So the how, as in how can we make um, building APIs easier? And what I'm talking about primarily is kind of like writing APIs from scratch or potentially decoupling um, the monolith, like a legacy monolith code base. Um, well, Laravel, I think, is really well suited to API development. I've done a lot of API development. I've used many different frameworks in the PHP space. Uh, but yeah, in my opinion, Laravel is really great for that. Um, in REST, we have quite a lot of conventions and principles, and although there is often some debate in the community, you know, how do you specifically implement this or that, I think actually most of it is fairly um, straightforward. And we can use those strong conventions and principles um, to reuse code uh, when we're implementing API functionality. And from my experience, probably um, 70 to 80% of API-related logic in an application is very, very similar. So I'm not talking about the business, uh, business logic, just the API-related stuff, um, as in how the API of the application works. And we can use Laravel to a really great effect in order to generalize about things that are actually different about each resource, um, which is, would usually be a model in your application. So yeah, Laravel and REST, um, I think in summary there, they have a lot of similarities because they're both kind of oriented towards simplicity over convention, um, over configuration. They're quite interface and contract oriented and you can represent API resources as models really easily. <clears throat> so quite often um, the problem is that it takes time to invest in new tech. And I worked at a number of agencies in the past, so I, you know, this is, too true um, to me as well. Like I've seen this many times before. Uh, a lot of companies, they feel like they're squeezed by their competitors, so they always kind of have to prioritize um, new features or trying to catch up, trying to get the edge. And they typically don't want to get involved in doing things that they perceive as risky or something that they think might take a long time because the cost benefit is not very clear. Um, that's, that's the general problem we always have as developers. It doesn't really matter what type of company you work for, in my opinion. So why is this um, API boilerplate good? What does it actually give you? How does it improve your life? Well, it allows you to get going extremely quickly with API development. Um, there's almost no code necessary to be written for your, your basic bread and butter REST functionality. Uh, you can customize it and extend it whenever you need it um, to implement your own custom business logic. It's super easy to do this. It has uh, a lot of conveniences, a lot of little features. Um, it's just like really nice. 
Uh, it has a complimentary Docker setup if you, if you would like to use Docker. Um, if you don't want to use it, it's fine, not a big deal. Uh, in terms of the project, I try and keep it quite minimalist, and I try to keep it largely unopinionated. So I think it, it's kind of very hard to build a package and have it 100% unopinionated. It's like almost impossible, but I try and keep it fairly generic. Um, and there is some guidance in the docs for how to add more complex functionality, uh, which you can follow or not follow, it's up to you. Uh, and there's also a roadmap for some pretty awesome features. So like I said, it's a fairly new project. Um, starting getting some traction on GitHub, but there's a lot, of, lot more planned, I guess. But at the same time, just to kind of anchor your expectations, in terms of what this boilerplate doesn't do or isn't, so it obviously it doesn't implement your business logic, yet you're still going to have to write the code, um, which is actually good because you'll probably spend more time writing the more fun business logic code. And it does not magically know exactly how you want your API to behave. Um, again, it's quite conventional. Um, you can generally always extend it if you want to. Uh, and it does not integrate with every single Laravel project out there. So um, yeah, potentially if there's a package you really want to use, you might have to do some integration. Uh, <clears throat> my experience is pretty simple. And this boilerplate, it doesn't have a front end or anything like that. So it really follows the one job principle, as I like to call it. It does the one thing really well, the API, um, how you want to use it, you know, what you want to use React or Vue or whatever else. Maybe you don't even need a front end. It's up to you. Um, this is just the API. And the way, the kind of analogy that I thought of, it's quite simple. Um, if you watch Rick and Morty, you'll know that this funky blue character is uh, Mr. Misix. And the boilerplate is a little bit like that, in that it kind of does your chores for you, uh, makes your life a little bit easier, saves you a little bit of time here and there, but it's not God, it can't do everything, it just helps you a little bit. So, <clears throat> and more benefits of using the boilerplate. Well, as I said, it kind of shifts the focus away from the boring repetitive code towards the more uh, business specific logic. And that means that for every man hour of development hours, you're actually delivering more real value to your business. Um, less code is better. A conventional approach generally reduces complexity. There's less code to read. There's less that can go wrong. There's less code to unit test, which is great. Um, and it uses uh, normal object-oriented principles. So the boilerplate is essentially a seed project that you would use to start like a new repository. Um, it just follows standard op principles um, and existing Laravel conventions where possible. And what that means is that it's actually super easy to extend any part of the project, any part of the boilerplate. Um, so you can have your own, um, you know, if you don't like so the way something works, you can extend it and make it, make it different. It's really easy to do it in any circumstance. And all the heavy lifting is done by its own dependency package, which means it's super easy to update. There's not going to be like a, a nightmare to update from one version to another. Um, and like I mentioned, the preference is really to be minimalist. It's not to try and do everything and redefine everything about API development. It's just um, basically to save you time and effort and make some things more convenient. Uh, yep, and it does not require a lot of um, effort in terms of learning how to use it. Uh, where can it be used? Well, essentially, pretty much anywhere. Um, you can use it to build a large enterprise scalable system from scratch. You can use it to build small microservices, and this is kind of what we're doing um, at our company. Um, you can use it to, um, as a means of taking apart the monolith. So I'm sure many people here work on really large um, legacy code bases. And if you want to um, kind of switch more towards the microservices and have a more manageable code base across your project, you typically want to pull out domains and you know, shove them in their own repositories, in their own projects. Um, or if you just need a proof of concept or RAD, uh, because the whole point of this is it's designed to save you time, it's really good if you want to just get going really quickly and just try something out. Um, if you're working on a hobby project, like in my case, I can build um, the back end for like a fairly simple project in one weekend like pretty easily using this boilerplate. So yeah, it has a lot of use cases. All right. So that's pretty much all the slides I have. I'm going to do a demo for the rest of the time. Hopefully, it goes kind of well. Uh, there is a lot of stuff I could demo, so we'll just, I don't know, see how we go. I'll show you probably the highlights. Um, what I have for my demo, it's like a demo repository using this boilerplate. And essentially, it implements like a really simple uh, forum project. So you have, um, have forums, you have uh, topics, posts. There's like users and roles, um, 
there's not really much else. It's a super simple project. It's up on GitHub as well. <clears throat> so uh, what I'll show you to begin with, just gonna pull up my notes. Uh, what I'm show you to begin with is I'm gonna add a new API resource to this project and the API resource will be an announcement. So you could post up announcements in a form potentially. And the way that you would uh, do this, just grab a drink of water. Uh, go to the Artisan CLI. Hopefully everything works. So one of the things that Boilerplate does is it adds a new command called make API resource, which is a generator command. It's kind of a, a combination of various other generators um, and some rework stubs. So I'll show you what it does. If I do make API resource announcement. So it sets up a model, sets up a controller. Um, typically you'll wanna have one controller for a given endpoint. Uh, asks you, do you want a policy for this resource? So policy, if you're um, not familiar, it's a Laravel convention to um, essentially have abilities against the resource and match up those abilities against the authenticated user to denote whether that user has the ability to perform that action or not. I'll just say yes. Um, create some migration asks you, do you want to see it as well? I'll just say yes. So in doing that, it kind of sets up I think, five different things that things are listed. And it also uh, spits out a little bit of code down the bottom here. So this is like an example of what you could put in your outs file. So I'm just gonna copy this. Uh, quite frequently, you might not need every type of um, HTTP method for a resource, but just for the sake of it, I'm gonna add all of them here. This is my routes file. Oh. So I'm just gonna add it here. Um, yeah, nothing crazy here. We're just calling the new announcement controller. So this is the controller that's been spun up. Um, not really much here. Um, the way it works, like I said, it's just object-oriented stuff, so it'll extend your controller, which is in your repository, which in itself extends the boilerplate controller, and this has a lot of the functionality um, that the boilerplate actually provides. And then this, in turn, um, uses something called the RESTful uh, service, which has kind of like Lego pieces that you can assemble in whatever way to manipulate um, API resources. It's quite useful. Um, so what have we got in, uh, in here by default? We're just saying, hey, for this controller, we're gonna be using this announcement model class. It just binds the two together. Um, there is this property called parent model. It's not necessary in this case, but if you were to have a resource which is a child of another API resource, so think in a forum you might have topics, so topic would be a child resource of forum. You could put that here and you can um, unlock some extra functionality that way. And res uh, transformers I'll talk about in a little bit. And if I were to open the model, so it looks very much like a default Laravel model. There's not that much difference here. I'm just gonna put in the primary key of announcements ID and I'll jump to the migration, do the same thing here. I'll just add a couple of, um, couple of fields in the table. So I'll add a string field for a title of the, um, of the announcement and I'll add a text field of content. And just copy that in here to set it as a primary key. So ideally that would just kind of work. We'll see in a minute. I'll jump back to the model and I'll just set title and um, content as fillables. Okay, so not a lot of work there that I did. Basically all I did is just put in the fields that I want in that resource, in the migration and in the model. Um, but ideally should be everything. Let's just try and migrate clean and see what happens. No errors, okay, perfect. Um, everything's migrated. So that's basically all that I've done. Um, and now I'm gonna show you the end result in Postman. And just gonna log in here, it'll work. So I have a, uh, can everyone see that by the way? I can log in a little bit, or I can zoom in a little bit more. So I have some uh, 
I have some requests. It's just basic CRUD requests. So let's say to create an announcement, it's a post request. We've got a title, we've got content. I'm going to send that request. It'll work. Um, get a 200 or 201 rather. And this is the new resource that's created. Um, as you can see, it's got the title and content that we, we had in our request. Additionally, um, a UUID has been generated for this resource, and it's got your usual um, created, updated timestamps. Uh, you can retrieve that same resource using your get with that UUID up here in the, um, in the request. <coughs> Gets the same resource, um, nothing crazy. We're going to update it with uh, updated content. It's a patch request, and as you can see, it looks like it works. Uh, before I delete it, I might show you. So this is the get collection endpoint, so we're getting all announcements. At the moment, there's only one. Uh, let's create a couple more. Just to show you I'm not lying. So <laughs> here are the three announcements. They're all here. Uh, let's go ahead and delete the last one. Yep, two or four. And if I get them again, there should be two. And there are, in fact, two uh, announcements. So, yeah, this is like very simple REST functionality. Um, it's going to be fine for like, I don't know, 60, 70% of your resources. Uh, and all of that you get for doing basically nothing. All you do is specify the fields, and all of this happens automatically, which is pretty cool. Uh, Okay, so that's the first part of the demo. I might jump to the second part by cleaning my working directory. All right, so this is essentially just following on from this first part of the demo. I just did a couple of other things, um, namely I tied announcements to forums with a foreign key. So if I open up that migration, uh, yeah. So I just have forum tying to, I'm um, sorry, announcements tying to forums. And if I open up the model, uh, just to show you what it looks like, I guess. Uh, again, just a relation here, very simple. Other thing I wanted to kind of show you, so in terms of validation rules, how does it work? Well, there's a function here called get validation rules. And it just returns a list of rules for that resource. The boilerplate will know to automatically pick up those rules and use them in any instance that's relevant. So it might be a post or a put request where you're creating a new resource, or a patch put request where you're updating your resource. Um, you can also, there is another function called get uh, validation rules for updating, just in case they might be slightly different. But that's basically how you would define rules. If you have a particularly complex um, resource, you might actually want to create a request class for that and do it there instead. But this is like the simple way of doing it. So um, yeah, we've got the same announcement here. Uh, if I, did I just migrate? I think I did. I'll do it again just to be absolutely safe. I'll have to re-log in as well. So I'm going to create that same announcement. You'll see. Ah, uh, hold on, I'll open up number two. You're going to actually create a new forum as well. Forum is called Gadgets. And I will create an announcement in that forum. So you'll see there's like a forum ID, UUID here. Uh, this is one way of doing something like this. You could potentially make it a, a child resource, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, both, both are fine. So, yep. There we have the forum ID here. Now, one of the great things about the boilerplate is the transformation, which can get quite complex. So in this case, if I were to put um, this forum in this item with attribute, it will actually return uh, this same announcement with that model transformed and put here. And you can actually do this, nest this as much as you like. There's two things the boilerplate adds, which is item with and collection with. So item with is kind of like within Laravel, 
Now, the difference is it's actually only used um, when you're using that resource from the top level in the API. Um, it doesn't, it's not used when you're kind of working with it model internally, which is really great for performance. And collection width, um, very similar. Uh, it basically allows you to specify different relations that you want to load when you're doing a get all request. And the reason this might be useful, um, again, if you have very heavy resources in your system, you might tie them to like 20 other resources, which is what you want if you're viewing just that one resource. But if you're viewing like uh, 20 or 100 of them, you probably don't want that. It's not going to be very performant. So you have an out of the box way to kind of customize that. Uh, what else? I'll show you as well uh, transformers. So if you've used uh, the league serializer package, you might be familiar with this. Uh, essentially, it's a way of um, specifying a custom transformer for a model. So it's probably not necessary 80% of the time, but sometimes it can be quite useful. So I'll just show you what that looks like. So in this case, uh, all I'm doing is calling the parent transformer, which does a lot of the heavy lifting. I might actually quickly show you. There's a lot of uh, functionality in here. A lot of it is to do with um, transforming keys as well as related uh, models. Uh, so all I'm doing here is I'm going to add an extra attribute called some new attribute and add some music lyrics here as an array and return it. So if I were to view this same announcement now, yeah, it should be here. So this is the usefulness of transformers. You can do some pretty complex stuff um, using transformers. You can also transform a resource, uh, for example, for the purposes of sending it in a webhook, maybe to different API consumers. You want them to view different kinds of data. Uh, probably another thing quite useful to point out that transformers are used um, API-wide. So it's not only if you're uh, viewing this specific resource here. But if it's a related resource of another resource, they'll also be instantiated. So I'll give you a very brief demo of that. So if we were to view the forum that that announcement is posted in here, you'll see that um, that announcement is actually a relation of the forum. So it's here because it's specified in the controller for forum. And you will see um, this little tidbit here which we had in our transformer, it's here as well. So basically the boilerplate will know to use the right transformer for the right model, regardless of how deeply nested it is in your hierarchy, which can be pretty cool. Um, what else? I'll just show you briefly the child resources. So what's an example? I think a topic is an example. So yeah. So we have our forum. Let's say we want to create a topic in this forum. So you can use this type of thing. And the boilerplate will automatically put that resource um, and tie it back to the original parent resource. There's a whole bunch of other cool stuff it does regarding abilities and authorization, but probably not time to go into that one. So if I send that, you'll see um, Yeah, it creates this topic. Uh, topic is called gadgets, I think. And if we were to view this forum, share topics and forum, you'll see that, yeah, it's here. If I create another one, hopefully I'm not going to get like a duplication error. Let's call it something else. Uh, computers. So share topics and forum. Yeah, you can see they're all here, all three of them. And this is also a great, uh, great example of um, getting a collection of a parent resource. So parent resources forum, you're getting all topics in that forum. Um, again, all this happens pretty much automatically. Um, this is just commented out. So again, there's not really anything going on here. All we're doing is specifying that this is a topic resource, parent model is forum. Um, nothing else here other than saying uh, item with topics forms. So yeah, I guess the key theme is uh, very little work to get any of this going. If you at any point in time do want to override some functionality or add functionality, this is essentially how you would do it. You would just create that same method and the methods are named after the HTTP verbs. So it's like really simple. Um, you can call the parent method if you want. Um, if not, you can um, 
implement whatever functionality you want here. And um, yeah, it's really simple. Cool. How am I going for time? All right, maybe I'll demonstrate a couple of other things really quickly. So, yeah. Probably I'll just show you this one. It's pretty cool. Um, so when it comes to API development, some people like um, to use snake case, some people like to use camel case for their keys. Um, what I'm referring to is you know, this kind of stuff here. You'll see this is camel case. Um, typically front-end developers prefer it this way. Um, Back-end developers, a lot of the time they want uh, um, snake case. So this boilerplate allows you to configure um, very easily which case you want. But even on top of that, it actually gives you the ability to specify at runtime which case you would prefer. So you could send this header here, which is called x except um, case type. And it will actually transform that accordingly, and you'll see this is snake cased. So this is, um, <laughs> yeah, it's really useful if you have, for example, uh, multiple API consumers, and you have your front end guys saying, hey, we'd like camel case. You have your back end guys working on another microservice saying, hey, we'd like snake case. Like, all right, whatever, you guys use whatever you want. It's not a problem. Um, what else? There's another, there's some other um, nifty things it does. So for example, there's a middleware uh, used across the whole API which converts incoming, um, incoming content into snake case. So for example, you'll see, well, it's probably not a good example here, but let's say if you had, um, you know, some kind of attribute like this, it'll actually be converted into snake case inside your API automatically before it enters any controller. And what that actually means is that whoever is using your API, they can actually use both um, snake case or camel case. Doesn't really matter, it makes no difference to the API. It's really convenient. It's like a small thing, but pretty convenient. Um, additionally, there is, if I can open up my routes file. There is another middleware called check roll. It's super simple. All it does is check the role of the currently logged in user and um, <coughs> it will restrict those endpoints to so that group of endpoints or that one endpoint to that to users of that role. So this is a really simple way of handling um, authorization. Um, in some cases, like sometimes you just want a whole group of routes to be admin only, for example. It's a really easy way of doing that with like very minimal effort. Uh, alternatively, we have policies like this. So if you work with um, uh, abilities in Laravel, this will be kind of very similar. Um, it just uses the normal Laravel uh, ability system to check whether a user of a, you know, a certain user model has access to a certain resource. And you can put whatever logic you want here. Um, you know, you could say, does the creator, is the creator of this resource this user? It's like a really simple example. Um, but you can have anything you like. Um, there's also a way to, this, this little nifty function called qualify collection query with user. Um, what this does is, uh, if, you have, uh, if you're listing a whole bunch of resources, sometimes you might want to provide a curated view. So for example, you want to list all resources created by the currently logged in user. And this gives you a very easy way to do that. So you can just add a query specifier to say, you know, where author ID equals, you know, the current user. <coughs> so there's a lot of nifty little things like this. Um, I'll just show you, oh, I've got about a minute left. I'll just show you the package on GitHub, just so you don't mistake it for some other package. There's, um, I didn't actually realize, but there are like three packages with the same name, so I probably should have made it more specific. But this is it. Um, so it's a seed project, which means you can kind of click this use this template button and it will just create a new repository in GitHub using this seed project. Uh, alternatively, you can use the create project command, which you would use um, with Laravel probably by default as well. So uh, it's probably the easiest way to get started. Uh, just some links to that project that I just showed you just right now. I'll post this on Twitter, I guess. And yeah, 
I think that's just about everything that I had. Um, thank you very much. I will be at the After Dark event, and uh, I'll be here like both days if you want to come chat to me. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you.